All right, we'll resume our hearing and next we have uh, Copley's presentation of its budget. Um, we've allocated about 45 minutes for the presentation and then we'll have board member questions that follow. Public comment today will be at the end of all the presentations. Um, Mr. Wooden, could, could you and your team raise your right hand so I can administer the oath? Um, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Great, thank you. Um, nice to see you all. Thank you for being here, and I will turn it over to you for your presentation. Okay, I'm going to share the screen, guys. Please let me know if there's an issue. Can everybody see the uh, screen? We can, yes. Great. Great. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate being here. Um, <clears throat> myself, uh, Joe Wooden, I'm the administrator. Jeff Jeffrey Hebert's here to my right, Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Dupuy, the Chief Medical Officer. General Surgeon is also with us, and Sam Allaire, the Chief Nursing Officer. In addition, we have two board members very interested in these affairs, always asking good questions and helping you know, steer the organization, Kathy DeMars, who's a nurse. She's chair of the uh, board of trustees, and she's also the CEO of the Home Health and Hospice Agency, which is next door to the hospital, which is lovely. And Bongiorno, she's also an RN, and uh, she's the vice chair. So we'd like to do overlap and make sure that we have consistency. So Anne wanted to be here today. Also, she works also for the State University of New York. So that's who we have here to answer any questions or to chime in on some of the presentation. Today, we've got basically five things we're going to go through, just an overview, some discussions about the strategic plan, uh, finances, which is going to be the majority of it, uh, as well as sort of aspects of quality and access. access. Thanks very much. Our mission, <clears throat> we've changed it now and then, which is, you know, which is fun, but we like to consider just exceptional quality care close to home. These are just some examples of the camaraderie and the teamwork and the fun that we try to have together, whether it's the 4th of July or dressing up for Halloween. We do a lot of stuff. Uh, people work very hard here. And you see those five attributes about everything from lifelong learning to service excellence. So very common. Uh, next picture. Is so My apologies. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm having audio difficulty hearing is a. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you sound like you're underwater. Is, am I the only one hearing this? No, I'm hearing that. I'm not sure who's talking. In fact, it's so unclear. Uh, right. OK, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, can we um, try to fix this situation? Um, so I can hear Copley and you totally fine, Michelle. Um, I think it's Dr. Merman. Um, uh, Dr. Merman, why don't you send me a message if you need something now and we'll let Copley continue and um, okay. send me a message and I'll, and Joe, I'm sorry, you can keep going. Okay. It, can everybody see this slide where it says the annual report? No. No. Oh, sorry. No, no we see the budget presentation. Oh. Uh, Okay, it's a Jeff thing on our end. Thanks, Dave, for bringing that up. Let's. All right, guys. I'm. I'm going to go. Can you guys see the uh, uh, the annual report right now? Yes. Page five of our. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we missed those first few. It's fine. We're on page five. So this is just a lovely picture of Copley going back to 1932, 92 years old. Um, great old OR pictures, etc. And. Um, here's our hospital. I always love to think about this. Uh, one of the things that I collect that don't cost anything, I always ask people who are new to the organization to get to know, hey, do you collect anything? I collect antique Vermont hospital postcards. I have a collection of all the old postcards from hospitals. Here's one I've had for years for Copley, which is 
out of Honda in 1932. It's now owned by the designated agency, which is great, the Monroe County Mental Health Services. And uh, we did find an old uh, fundraising um, materials on the right where people would bring food. I know in, in these old hospitals, the community involvement was so important that they would do food drives to help fill up the pantry in the root cellar of the hospital. Saw that at Gifford when I worked there, they had a root cellar still in the hospital. And sometimes they do linen drives way back then to get sheets and blankets and towels for patients. So I just thought that might be interesting. So not sure what happened there. Okay, uh, we're just a small independent uh, nonprofit, one of eight critical access hospitals. Service, I, I throw this up, service area population. It's so hard to determine, but I know when we do a lot of data and graphs, people just quickly use the word service area, which is a denominator, both the numerator and denominator come out to that performance issue, but the HSA definitions are really unusual. So for us, for orthopedics, it's certainly much greater, but for that birthing center, it's much smaller. So it's kind of interesting. I'm a big uh, fan of data and I'm also a big critic of data. I just want to throw that out. We have emergency department visits, employees, paychecks. Overview of services. I wanted to bring this up because it will relate to a future slide and presentation. What services do we provide? You know, how do we describe them? So we have a number of surgical services, cardiology, anesthesiology, Birthing Center, OBGYN, Oncology. So it's kind of interesting. Um, what services do we provide? How long have we provided them? How is that going? It's a discussion that we think about, certainly strategic planning wise and others, and we've been prompted to do that, but I thought that slide would be helpful. Uh, the patients that we serve were a little bit unusual. We only serve about 60% of the folks in our county. Now, is our county the service area again? use these sort of broad descriptions, uh, but 32%, give or take, are Chittenden, Washington, Caledonia, Orleans. So we serve a lot of people outside that come to us. So that's great. Uh, next slide, again, again, sort of of interest. How do you come up with a total for patients you serve? And anytime you look at data, we look at inpatients, outpatients, the description of each, it's important inpatient is clear, outpatient, there's a whole discussion about what you count as an outpatient patient experience and then the total. So just as interest, you know, uh, one of them noted is Burlington, South Burlington, below that's Montpelier Essex Junction. And I love the one at the very bottom, which is other Vermont towns of which we have 183 inpatients and 16,000 outpatients. And then there's some out of state, out of country, just kind of interesting what we do and what we look like. So that's all. Slide. Um, when I look at the overview, we are again one of the eight critical access hospitals. There's PPS hospitals that are between sort of an academic medical center and ourselves. I think it's important that you look at them that way because we're different given our size and uh, some of our reimbursement through Medicare, but also distance from each other, length of stay requirements. There are some restrictions around the CAH that we have to be aware of. So next slide, always like to show this one. We are humbly 3% of the hospital spend, which is fine and understandable. The UVM is about 50%. The network is somewhere around 62%, but we're, we're small but mighty. I think that's the way we describe ourselves. Next slide. Um, I, I always like to bring this up because it's a trivia question you can ask people. What's the second largest hospital that serves Vermonters? And it turns out it is Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center with about $400 million in uh, uh, net patient revenue. Look up above, which is really kind of interesting. I know they're on the other side of the river, but that's pretty close. So, uh, and we appreciate them in a variety of ways. So, next slide. Um, I want to go into some just a quick discussion about the strategic plan. Um, we've done a strategic plan from 22 to 24. We're actually going to not continue to, to do another three year plan. We're going to do that next year. So we're, we're kind of like a, a high school student that's a little lost. We're going to call, call it a gap year. We're not lost and we're not trying to find ourselves, but it's we've got a lot on our plate. I think the 
first plan that we did was excellent. But for this year, we're going to stick with the current plan, make some modifications in the board, nothing huge. And then next year, we're going to work on the 26 to 28 uh, strategic plan. Next slide. So in all of the previous plans, you can't read those, but you, you could if you grabbed it online and make a copy of it. But um, the four issues are financial sustainability, quality, workforce, and culture, and keeping care local. We spent a lot of time getting to those four. I think they're probably somewhat timeless and their importance to us. The order makes a big difference and had a lot of feedback and some people being disappointed who weren't really part of the process, understandable. Like, why would you put finances first? Shouldn't your call be to quality? And it's like, of course, quality and the care that we serve is paramount. However, of late, you know, we've just realized we've got, we're really fragile and we've got a lot of financial issues with operating margin, which you're aware of. And that's why we're going to talk about that because at the end of the day, if you run out of money, it, uh, it changes everything. And as they say, um, when, when funds are short, table manners change. I think that might be a Vermont term, you know? And so we're trying to prevent that and uh, trying to be professional and respectful. So next slide, related to the strategic plan, we had the Oliver Wyman report that's been um, presented in many events. Uh, Dr. Bruce Hamry and his team, I think have done a wonderful job. I, I think it's been helpful. And I can only offer my thanks and appreciation. It is an outside person just objectively looking at you. Uh, and he is sensitive enough to hear stories and to spend time with people, but at the end of the day, him and his team do look at the data and they do look at what's going on in Vermont and they're very concerned about our financial viability, all of us. So I thought it was great. And I love the fact that it says the point is to support hospital transformation. And we're gonna go down that road um, and also ask that the Green Mountain Care Board in future discussions, as well as the Agency of Human Services help support us in that process. Because going from point A to point B Point B looks great. You should be at point B. If it was that easy, we would already be there. So we're going to need help, any of us that go through these transformation discussions, particularly about services, maybe locations, expenditures, you know, what, what you do and why you do it. And um, I know our board is very queued up for this discussion. It's going to take a lot of heartfelt consideration, but I appreciate that. I do want to pass on this next slide. I only bring this up because it's my personal experience. I'm sure I'm the only one that appreciates cognitive overload. That's just for me, but I wanna share it because my therapist said this would be helpful for the group. <laughs> my brain can process a certain amount of information presented in different methods. The brain processes the information you gather each day from reading a newspaper, looking at the Becker's reports, looking at consulting reports from the state of Vermont, individual department reports, following directions on a map, or also budget instructions, requests for information, thousands of spreadsheets we fill out, and having conversations with a friend. So today, I guess I'll consider this conversations with a friend, but we all suffer with cognitive overload. I know yesterday, um, Jeff and I sat in some of the your uh, presentation report, you had five, I think it was five reports that you went over. And, you know, the report on hospital transformation, really appreciate that. The Act 167 report, we're going to take that seriously. And we're, we're you know, we're not going to keep reading more and more reports, but we do know that we need to possibly look at what we do, why we do it, and what can we afford. Um, but I think I suffer like perhaps just maybe one or two in the room that the chart on the right, the more data, the more confusion I get. But thanks for listening. That was helpful. Next slide. So in the strategic planning process and even prompted by the thought of transformation, um, during COVID, there was some good parts of COVID. We got desperate enough to, to work together locally there was six of us, the hospital, two, two large primary care offices, the nursing home, the mental health agency, and home health and hospice. Um, 
So it was great. Those are probably the six largest providers of care in our community. There's 26 total local agencies below, but it did cause us to work together and it still has given us benefits. And we have relationships and we can talk about things. Um, we also have just embarked about doing that with the New England Collaborative, which is really exciting. And um, that's the sort of logo on the right. And there's three of us that are part of that. But we're also going to try to apply some of the efforts of the New England Collaborative locally to our six, six agencies that are working together. So it's kind of interesting. The difference, one of the differences in this collaborative is that we're going to try to consolidate, save money, standardize consistency, everything from labor, purchasing, contracts, policies. But we're also going to try to work locally and say if anybody wants to share those things. I know with COVID, we all desperately needed to know what's your policy? What are you doing? Are you letting staff in the doors? How many masks are you to you? What are you doing in terms of uh, negative room, you know, negative rooms or HIPAA filters? So, anyways, next slide. Yep. The collaborative. Um, some of the challenges we're working on are keeping care local. That is sort of interesting. It was previously part of our strategic plan. It didn't cause this, but this is what we all struggle with: reducing costs, managing workforce and a host of other issues. But in the text on the left towards the bottom, it says the goal is to remain independent by creating an interdependent framework that achieves scale and efficiency for each of us. And we've been doing some of that. We've been sending staff to some of the other collaborative hospitals. We've been sharing some providers with the other hospitals. We've had board meetings, lunches. We invite them to our strategic plans. We've actually really are so interested as we move forward to get to know each other and to know how can we help because we're sort of like minded given our size and the challenges. So I think that's great. That slide just shows that we, we did get some positive thrusts, which was great. Um, Chris Doherty from Brattleboro, myself, and Peter Wright from Northwest Medical Center all sort of signed up for that. So it's been exciting and um, Again, we'll probably see if people can help us to come together because again, making transformational change takes encouragement from others and sometimes a little advice, if not grant money, et cetera. The last collaborative discussion I want to have is with Dartmouth Hitchcock Radiology Services. And anytime we talk about collaborative, we don't we don't just stick with one organization. It's we're small and dynamic and we make decisions as necessary. So we uh, probably two years ago started the process of looking at our radiology services, the radiologists, as well as the equipment, both our MRI, CT, other equipment. And uh, we entered into a partnership with Dartmouth Hitchcock July 1st as the sole provider of radiology degrees. So they're going to do that for us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We eliminated VRAD and virtual radiology services during off hours, commonly used in most small hospitals all across the country. There are thousands of people that use sort of VRAD. Uh, we're going to have in-person radiologists here Monday through Friday, um, and we're going to have much more specialized radiology access. So that's some excellent feedback. We did look at two other options. One was UVM, but that's not part of their business model currently, which is fine. We asked them and the other option we had was out of Connecticut. Um, those are the ones that were really interested in bidding, but I think with the Dartmouth system, we're the maybe 13th or 14th hospital part of that. I don't know, Don, if you wanted to add to this at all. Dr. Dupuy, our chief medical officer has been a big part of this transformation. No, except we're <clears throat> we've been really happy to um, be able to use Dartmouth's radiology expertise, their national class medical center, and uh, we've been uh, thrilled with the quality of uh, their work output and their ability to help us care for our patients. And we sometimes periodically send to them, depending upon the circumstance, primarily send always to UVM, but there's circumstances, as we have learned during COVID, where sometimes that medical center is full and we're sending to either Dartmouth or somebody is sending to Boston. So we had a lot of that. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Jeff. Finances. Um, 
and I know you're going to wait to the end if there are questions, but if somebody wants to ask a question, let me know. Although we can't really see that. I, just, yeah, I, I did have a question. Um, would you say, or maybe John, would you say that using this new radiology service reduces the need for patient transfer when the patient doesn't necessarily need tertiary care, but with VRAD, maybe you couldn't get the specific kind of specialized radiology. And if I think, and Don, it will certainly help in that process having uh, on site their expertise and plus their ready access to their entire radiology team. Again, that serves, I don't know, 14 different hospitals constantly, 24 hours a day. They might, we might do put our toe in the water with some interventional radiology. I'm not really sure that's a possibility, but we're going to have a higher caliber of, of uh, physicians on site to manage things. But your thoughts on that, Dr. Quigg? Um, yeah, I can't think of a, uh, an actual incidence, but the main thing that uh, having Dartmouth do our radiology has done is reduce the uncertainty of what's going on uh, diagnostically, which allows us to make better decisions. So we might make a transfer decision sooner, or we might decide we don't need to check as we can, in fact, deal with this problem. And, and less uncertainty is really always better. Okay, uh, finances want to go to the <clears throat> least savory subject about our operating margin or gain over the past uh, sort of 10 years. We have eight years of actual. So uh, we've been struggling um, historically. I know the one year we did well was because we have COVID funding FY21, and most hospitals had that recognized in 21 or 22. But if we didn't have that, we would have again lost about 1.2%. Um, we're, we're working very hard to try to get out of that. I know we had a mid-year rate increase that we're hopeful that will bring us to at least a break even. We were hoping for positive operating margin, but we appreciate everybody listening to some of the data and our challenges. Um, you look at our critical access hospitals five-year operating margins for everybody being in that same group. Um, some folks are struggling a lot more than others. Some of this data, I go back five years. Sometimes I like to look at 10 years to just to see what's going on. So we are down there on the bottom right. You'll see that Copley is um, for five years negative, about 520,000. I put note below, same order as in years past for that chart on the right. So the order was, the previous orders were a Porter Montescutney. So the order sort of stayed the same. The only change is that Copley's gotten better. So we're not the worst, unfortunately, but North Country is certainly struggling as it's just what the data shows. But so there is movement. Um, we're usually at the bottom, still sort of are. So want to share that. Next slide. I think Jeff's going to go over this. This is uh, some material he found around the cost of care, cost for adjusted discharge. So I'll let Jeff share that. Yeah. And if I could, um, I just want to do a shout out. Does everybody see the current slide cost of care, cost for adjusted discharge? Yes. Great. Great. All right. Um, so cost of care. Um, Looking at our um, cost of care for adjusted discharge, this data was published by the NASHP. Um, they used 2022 cost report data. You know, as we were like looking into the budget process, uh, you know, um, and what type of data we needed to use, this was recommended by Boz. And I could also read this throughout the narratives um, that were posted, um, you know, online. But what it shows is it shows that Copley's at uh, um, 8,587. Um, we're the third lowest in the state. The Vermont critical access median, the median that we really uh, kind of focus on, um, their cost of care is 10,179. The overall Vermont median, looking at all Vermont hospitals, is 12,430. We also have uh, on this chart the national CAH, which is at 14,038, and the uh, national median, which is at 11,987. 
you know, when I look at this chart, I, you know, you can see that Copley um, does offer, um, you know, uh, um, you know, its care at a low cost. However, our quality is one of the most important, if not the most important, and we are able to still do that at a high quality, um, you know, care level. Um, but what I also wanted to communicate is, however, um, our reimbursements per dose, um, you know, going over the operating margins just haven't been enough to, um, you know, demonstrate that we've been able to cost or um, cover that care with reimbursed, uh, um, with our reimbursements. And that's why we're having those low, um, low operating margins. The next slide um, is a slide that Joe did want me to put in. Um, it does have uh, um, Grace added to it. I excluded it because Grace was, um, you know, their uh, cost per adjusted discharge in the study was at 57,000. And uh, so just perspective. So I, Jeff wanted to just use the previous slide because you can see some level of variation. Uh, sometimes when, when, when we don't look at the highs and lows, don't look at the data, don't really understand why something would be so extraordinarily low, which is perhaps days cash on hand or extraordinarily high or even an infection rate or something else. So just wanted to throw that in there. Not, not sure if it's all accurate, but that's kind of the data that we have. All right, the next slide um, was data that was supplied to us last year. It also uses 2022 cost report data. Just basically was a, a nice representation, you know, to try to understand where our admin costs um, were to our clinical costs in regards to salaries. And so when we take a look at this, you can see that uh, um, we again only looked at uh, um, Vermont CAHs. And in this uh, graph, uh, copy is the second lowest. Okay, um, in, in looking at our finances, we went over operating margin, cost of care, with the margins that have been sort of insufficient, cost of care is some of the lowest. Capital, buildings and equipment, were significantly underfunded historically, so this chart shows 11 years uh, worth of sort of cutbacks in our investments, where the right, it says, well, did we save $12 million when we got approved $55 million in the budget process through our board, through our assessment, Fremont Care Board, we only spent $42 million of it. So uh, that's that's not good that we weren't able to execute on that. And if you go to the next slide, we did update this for today to add our actual performance for 22 and 23. So if you look at the past few years, 21, 22, 23, we're getting our footing. Things are getting better. We're trying to stay in that green band of routine capital goal and needs for the organization. It's great. But last year, 23, we were small enough that if we don't have a building project finish, which we had a renovation the project didn't finish because of contractors timing and the cost of that, it got kicked to the next year. So um, when you when you run the numbers, we still went from sort of being 12 million behind, we're like 13 million behind, but we're, we're getting better, but it's going to be done. So we're getting a lot better, but we certainly need the help and support. So slide just going to go over some cash issues. So again, this is days cash on hand. Um, this is a, another, um, you know, graph that we consistently trying to present. These are um, the critical access hospitals in Vermont. Um, for the five-year average, Copley has been averaging, um, you know, 76 um, days cash on hand, which is the uh, second lowest in the five-year average. Um, looking at the FY 2023, unfortunately, Copley is the lowest at 43 days cash on hand as compared to the other CAHs. Um, you know, this is just a demonstration that we feel that the, um, Copley needs several years of positive operating margins to be able to rebuild our cash reserves. Another data um, slide that I was able to get from last year was um, looking at cash for operations. And when you take a look at the, um, the overall cash for operations um, for the CAHs in uh, Vermont, you can see that uh, um, Copley is the third lowest. Um, the lowest is Grace at uh, um, two million, but uh, their cash is sort of tied up, as I understand it. And the second lowest is uh, Springfield, um, but they're coming out of uh, um, you know bankruptcy. 
So uh, um, we're not, you know, positioned in the best place. Um, with this, I just want to say that, uh, you know, all we're looking to do as an organization, and again, Joe was alluding to this, is we just need to be reimbursed like other Vermont hospitals, you know. Um, and uh, um, we also understand that we need to be able to, um, you know, capitalize any opportunities that come our way. Um, just recently, we needed to finance a, uh, a project and the USDA stepped up and it was a great opportunity to do that. And uh, we also have to be as vigilant as possible, looking at our AR, um, making sure that uh, we're collecting it as quickly as we can and collecting it as uh, um, as well as we can. Yeah, and I will, I will just sort of say that um, you know the board and all of us continue to look at expenses. And how do we make do with what we have, or how do we look at our services because? We, we try to do both, so it's not a matter of uh, ignoring the fact that all of us, particularly as we talk about transformation through Act 167, we have to figure that out because we, we, we need a positive operating margin. We can't build up cash without at least uh, getting above the line. So thanks on that, Jeff. Uh, the next one, um, we're going to sort of launch into sort of prices and charges. So. Days cash on hand is fragile. Capital is underfunded. Cost of care is the lowest. Operating margin is insufficient. Sorry for all the dire news. I just have to be honest. I'm looking at the board members. You guys aren't seeing me, but I look at the two board members every time I talk about this, and they they shake their heads and they also wring their hands with me, trying to figure out like how do we get through this. So. Um, I've been collecting this data for a long time. So this is sort of the approved rate increases in requests for, I don't know, 19 years. And I think the problem for our blue line there properly, you can't read it, but systemically we just have not asked for enough money and our our prices and charges are just so low. It didn't, didn't happen all of a sudden. It's, it's been so far behind. And then for us to get better, it's going to take some time. I always give this analogy. We might have a lab charge cost $10. Somebody else has one for a hundred. And then you give us a 10% increase, which is quite big. So our $10 gets increased by a dollar. We go from 10 to 11. And if that hospital got 10%, theirs goes from a hundred to 110. And we never really catch up and the numbers are really dramatic. And so you know, it's it's hard to talk to you about this because your main focus has been control the rate. And you'll see later on in slides, well, well, Copley, you seem to have gotten a lot of late. You've had the most growth. You're doing really well with your rate increases. Go back to my analogy, you know, even if I'm at $30 and somebody's at 110, it, 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 the difference is dramatic. And we've shown you this data, but just wanted to start with this one. If you look at the next slide, this is our approved rate increases for the past 10 years. And I'm not sure what happened in 2015, 16, 17. I still scratch my head or 2018 in the sense that the hospital asked for zero as if we had no increases in pharmaceuticals or our labor cost or anything else. Uh, and in fact, granted us zero, but then in some cases, even you know, we got cut dramatically when we asked for zero. zero we got negative 3.7, negative three. So I, I don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened with the communication or how stuff was presented, but it goes way back. So here we are doing the best we can. I really appreciate and I'm really thankful that uh, folks, the analysts, the Greenmount Care Board folks, people are really looking at our particular circumstance and um, I'm thankful that you gave us a rate adjustment. We were looking for 15% to make 3 million. We, we got 8%, which actually would have put us to a negative 3 million, which was a $6 million swing. And so I appreciate that halfway through, we've got an additional seven, which should get us to, to zero and we're hopefully gonna be beyond zero. But, and, uh, you know, this is both math and history and um, we're as cost effective as we can be. I would love to invite somebody to come to any of you want to come see my office. I'm in, a, I'm in an old, 
gastroenterologist office that has been renovated in 50 years. He unfortunately became sick and gave up his practice. And, uh, I'd love to share with you our uh, boiler room, our IT closets, things that really are in dire need. So next slide. And our presentation last year, <laughs> this was one of the more salient slides. We have others, and this is showing our, you know, charges, you know, what our prices are for Copley, Vermont average, and then all the hospitals. And um, it's pretty interesting and dramatic how much we're not even close to average. So if you just take that first blue column and compare it to the green column, the things from last year are still are true, you know, CT of the abdomen and pelvis without contrast, second one from the bottom, 74176. We now charge about 1900, 1899, and the highest is around 6,500. So those are real numbers. That's not like $40 a piece. That's $4,200 more for a test that should cost 2,000. They're gonna pay 6,500. So when we, when we talk about fairness and balance and justice, it's hard when you're starting off with a foundation of payment that is so dramatically different. And again, we've given you these examples last year. Some of them are 900% more expensive, 700%. We're, we're pretty much always on the bottom or second to the bottom. Next slide, Jeff's gonna go over this. He, Jeff always looks at it and checks himself, does different methodologies to say, this is still stand true, Am I, are we looking at it correctly? So I appreciate this is a slide he wants to sort of talk about. So when we take a look at our overall 2021, um, when we kind of uh, um, started looking to try to get to average um, for Copley, um, we were the lowest um, as compared to the other uh, Vermont hospitals. To get to the second lowest in 2021, we would have had to have a rate increase of 19%. Um, and to get to the Vermont average in 2021, that would have been a rate increase of 44%. The next columns over represent the 2024. And I do want to um, you know, um, communicate that these, uh, um, this data does include the uh, mid-year rate increase that we got. And it's demonstrating that we're getting better. Instead of being the lowest, we're actually um, now the second lowest um, you know, the lowest being 4% behind us. And to get to Vermont average, we went from 44% in 21 to now only needed to get to 31%. We've also been able to, oh, oh, sorry. yeah, we've also been able to, uh, um, you know, uh, look at other data, um, you know, trying to understand if it's uh, demonstrated throughout um, other uh, um, benchmark data and using the stage data, which uses the RAND data um, from 2020 to 2022. This data looked at the commercial um, rate as a percent of Medicare, or the hospital price is X percent of Medicare. The next slides, I'm not expecting anybody to read, but this is a, a demonstration of all the critical access hospitals. Um, Copley is 144%. And the range of um, CAH hospitals um, go from Springfield at 158% to North Country at 265%. This slide represents the non-CAHs. And uh, um, again, you know, obviously Copley doesn't change. It's at 144. And this range goes from Northwestern, which is at 209%, to UVM, that's at 317%. Kind of taking all that data, just putting it into one simple graph, you can see that Copley using the uh, SAGE data um, in the state of Vermont um, is um, the lowest uh, um, cost um, for um, at 144. The state median is 283, and then the high again is UVM at 317. Uh, this this is somewhat of an old chart. Uh, the Green Mountain Care Board used to do this chart regularly. I know some people loved it. Um, it's kind of like going back to that you know, issue of too much data and information. It's always nice if we stick with them. This was done for many years, and it showed for our county, you know, the cost of care uh, 
with regards to charges, we have been sort of the lowest since 2014. Uh, uh, I like the chart because it was helpful. Many people used it, but we sort of threw it out and went to a new chart. Um, and I, and it, it does remind me about the date, data overload and, and getting people to at least stick with some data and information and not always jump around. Uh, the next one, of, we, we can go to this one, let me do an introduction. So when we when we look at uh, how hard we work and our, our charges, as opposed to the percent of rate increase that you grant us, which we really appreciate and desperately need, but somebody said to me, and that's a good point, well, on the commercial side, which everybody in Vermont needs the commercial side to break even and make some money. You're not going to get it on the Medicaid side. You're not going to get it on the Medicare side. We break even with Medicare. So the commercial side is really important. Um, good criticism. It's like, well, you only have the charges, but that doesn't help because individual hospitals have contractual arrangements with Blue Cross or, you know, MVP or Cigna. And so you don't really know ultimately what that gets paid. And um, Jeff and I talked about this. For some reason, Jeff found this information. I'm a little surprised I didn't know it in terms of, and it's in the same format of the previous about like, well, what are your charges? How much do you charge for, uh, you know, whether it's an appendectomy or some lab work, you know, or an ER visit. And so this, uh, Jeff, Jeff has this data and I'm like happy to confirm once again that Copley, even when you look at the commercial contractual arrangements, we, we're still like really, really low. So it's not like, oh, well, you might be getting paid a lot more because the insurance company be like, no, we're not. So just going to walk through a couple of these and some examples. Yeah. So the next three slides, I'm not going to spend much time on uh, on the actual charts because uh, um, it is quite small. But we've got uh, um, you know uh, Blue Cross, uh, Cigna, and MVP. But basically, in 2021, Medicare required hospitals, all hospitals, to post on their website a uh, file that they called uh, a machine readable file. This file represents all our charge. Um, charge master item numbers. Um, and uh, using this, they um, told you that you needed to demonstrate your uh, gross charge, as well as the contracted rate that you got from the payers. So being able to uh, um, get in this data, looking at this data, um, we're able to display it. Again, like the previous charge that Joe showed you um, with gross charges, the blue column is us. If the uh, column is green, that indicates that uh, um, that Copley is lower. And if the uh, column is red, that means that Copley is higher. And overall, you can see that the majority of, uh, um, of the uh, columns are green. The stars on the side just represent that Copley is actually the lowest reimbursed in the state of Vermont. And so taking that data, and kind of looking at some high level um, items. Um, if I were to take uh, um, from the Blue Cross Blue Shield reimbursed uh, um, file and looked at 87OAA, which is a urine bacteria culture, um, the state average overall um, gets reimbursed about $66, which is 144% higher than our rate of $27. The maximum hospital um, in the uh, um, in the data gets reimbursed at $194, which is actually 619% higher than us. The other um, one that I'll look at is the 87088. This is a culture um, aer um, aerobic. Um, the payer MVP Copley gets $44 reimbursed. Um, the state average is getting reimbursed about $126 or 186% um, percent higher. The maximum ho um, hospital in the study actually got $232, which is 427% um, higher than us. Kind of taking this data and just doing a little bit of an exercise, I went out and grabbed some volume information. I was looking specifically at um, a very common um, item number. That's 99283. This is a uh, level three ED state. I looked at the Blue Cross data. 
I took the volume for this hospital and then figured out, you know, estimated what uh, on their level three um, visits were, and then um, applied a percent for Blue Cross. So that came up to be about 3,777 visits. I then looked at what that hospital would have gotten if they got paid at Copley's rate, and that would have been $1,419,984. But using the hospital M rate, that hospital actually is getting reimbursed $4,448,781. It's a difference of $3 million, um, you know, basically $3 million. They're getting more for the same procedure that we're doing. Great. So, um, so, just sort of march through all that. Um, and I'm sorry, it's not great news. I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to digest and uh, board members here are looking at me with concern in their eyes, which we always do, because we're trying to keep, trying to, trying to make this work. And yet the data shows that it's really difficult. So our operating margin being insufficient is, is really uh, not a good sign for the patient at all. Cost of care is low, which is great, Capital underfunded problem, cash is very fragile, and our, I think one of the root causes is just our prices and charges are uh, so low, which is uh, kind of interesting. I don't know if you saw today's article um, in, um, I think it was WCAX, there was an article about the uh, new medical office building that we built in Waterbury, when the CON process answered a lot of questions. It was a great review on your part, our part, the board's part. None of this stuff makes it out without our very diligent finance committee and then the board looking at the mission and what we're doing. So we got through that, got through the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, in, the, in the wonderful uh, presentation open house yesterday, uh, one of our surgeons made a comment and used the word gold mine. And of course, that made the front page and made the top of the article. So. It says, is the new orthopedics office a gold mine for Copley Hospital? <laughs> you know, I, I, we can't control what people say. Um, no, if it was a gold mine, we, you know, we, we have broken tiles on the floor. We have leaking roofs. We have a lot of problems. It's just hard to read that because it's like, oh, my gosh. Uh, should be, you know, it should be. We're, and, and I know that um, the Green Mountain Care Board in the past has said we really appreciate your high quality, low cost, and, you know, keep, keep at it. But uh, we are going to need some help on the, on the uh, cost side because we, we just won't be able to do it very well. Fundamentally, why we do what we do is because of the patients. That is our mission, making sure that they're well cared for. And uh, Dr. Dupuis is going to talk about some quality issues. First, wanted to just share this one sort of uh, quote that I got, I kind of like it, you know, when you talk about quality, you know, the safety aspect, avoid harm to patients during their medical treatment. I think Don's going to actually reference that when he's talking about, is it effective providing medical service to patients who could benefit from them and avoid the use of services that are unlikely to result in better patient outcomes. Patient outcomes is always the most important thing we do. And then timely reducing wait times and delays for appointments and treatment. Some people have said to us, you're such a low cost provider. That's great. We should send you more care. We, we don't have the capacity. I don't have the resources. And we need some to be able to provide a little bit more care. But uh, right now, it's hard to get an appointment with Mansfield Orthopedics uh, at all or others. So Don's going to walk through some overall discussions about care. Thanks, Dr. Dupuy. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. So um, before I became a doctor, I was an engineer for uh, a bunch of years, so I'm, I'm rather fond of uh, data. And I think whenever you talk to people who have an interest in quality, they'll always say that <clears throat> you, you measure what you care about. <clears throat> and so if, we're, if we care about measuring the quality of our care at hospitals, in particular uh, surgical care, uh, there's really one undisputed gold standard, and that's this program called NESQIP, which is the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program run by the American College of Surgeons. It was started uh, about 25 years ago now when the VA system was not really a great place to get uh, medical care and they wanted to improve it. 
And the first thing they did is they decided they had to be able to measure quality to know whether any of the changes they made helped. And so they developed this Nesquip program, which actually measured the, the, the quality of outcomes from the surgeries, and it helped uh, the VA uh, system improve uh, quite a bit. And uh, I think uh, Joe, uh, toward the closing, will uh, will mention a little bit about the VA system. So uh, surgical outcomes, really, there's sort of there are two ways of thinking about it. One is the success of the surgery. If you're taking out an appendix or a colon cancer, it it's really is like it's Boolean. It's either did it happen or not. It's like the appendix either came out or it didn't. The colon cancer either came out or it didn't. So that's pretty straightforward. If you're improving if you're take, if you're giving someone a new knee, uh, success is uh, is a little bit more on a spectrum because uh, maybe they can ride their bike and they can ski again with their new knee, but maybe they can't do that. But maybe they can still go uh, take their dog for a walk, and uh, and so they're still pretty happy, although they maybe they like to ski, or maybe it, it didn't really help at all. Um, so that's one way of measuring uh, surgical success. The other way is is safety. And that's basically, uh, did we do the thing that uh, we think in medicine is primary, which is first, do no harm. So if we're helping somebody, are we not hurting them while we're, while we're helping? Them? And that's uh, really what uh, Nesquip measures. It measures uh, surgical safety. A few years ago, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board organized a group that developed a set of quality metrics uh, for Vermont, and I was I was I was privileged to be part of that group. And uh, when we were looking at lots of specific metrics that were available to uh, make common to all the reporting for all Vermont hospitals, we definitely wanted uh, to include the NISQIP data on there. A small problem with that is that there are only three hospitals that in Vermont that participate with this: UEM, Rutland, and Copley. And the main problem problem is that uh, in order to participate in this clip, it's a pretty rigorous uh, abstracting of patient uh, info. It requires a fair amount of effort, uh, which of course at one point translates to resources uh, and money. And uh, so it was thought at the time that it was, it was just too much to ask uh, all hospitals to uh, start doing that. At least this, this is what we thought uh, during the pandemic. So when this clip measures the uh, safety outcomes of, of surgeries, it, it reports uh, the data in sort of two uh, flavors. One is raw data, which you can think of as what actually happened when people actually went to a specific hospital and had the surgery. And uh, that is, I think that's extremely value, valuable because if you're gonna be a patient at that hospital, that'll tell you what you can really expect to happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, particularly the medical centers, uh, they sort of approach that data with a yeah, but kind of idea in that uh, they think that medical center patients uh, might be a little less healthy. Their case mixes may be skewed to slightly more complicated cases, which are prone to more complications. And uh, the uh, statistical folks uh, at Nesquip have a really strong belief that pretty much everyone is just average and that if uh, a hospital uh, conducted the average number of surgeries in the average NISQIP hospital, that basically they would be closer to a mean. You can think of it as a, uh, basically they regress the statistical data to reflect more what the mean is than what actually, uh, what actually happens. And uh, I, I can go on to explain that uh, a lot, but I, I think as a first pass, uh, that's uh, reasonably good. Uh, the, this first slide you, you see here is uh, basically uh, shows what, what happened at Copley and the average Nesquip hospital uh, since 2017, which is when we first uh, joined uh, Nesquip. And uh, uh, one thing that might be helpful is that uh, Nesquip hospitals, pretty much like the, the uh, situation in Vermont, where it's UVM, Copley, and Rutland, uh, they tend to be the hospitals 
that have uh, somewhat better reputations. And certainly all the hospitals that you've ever heard of that you can just think of off the top of your head around the country, they're all Nesquip hospitals. So being an average Nesquip hospital is actually, you're actually probably a pretty darn good hospital. So when uh, our data, the data you're seeing here is our 30 day readmission rate. When our data is a quarter of what the average Nesquip hospital is, um, we, we are quite proud of that data. Um, again, there are those yeah buts, but the other way of looking at it is that if you're a patient at Copley versus a patient somewhere else, this is what you can actually expect to happen. Basically, Nesquip reports dozens and dozens of categories. I, I, I think that, that probably if you're going to just pick three, the three to pick is the overall complication rate, which is this slide, the readmission rate, which is the last slide, and the surgical site infections will be, which will be the next slide. And so this is all complications that happen to all our patients. And you can see here, once again, that uh, we're basically about a third of what happens at the average uh, Nisquip hospital, which has to be pedantic about it, but is really a quite a good hospital. Here is the, uh, the surgical site infection rate. Um, uh, definitely our feeling is, is that uh, sort of the unsettled nature of practicing medicine during the pandemic uh, was a little hard on us and we're just really starting to recover from that. But then again, what, what we think is a problem is, is still really quite a bit better than the, than the average Nesquip hospital uh, around the country. So this data is definitely a little tougher to understand. This is the statistically modeled Nesquip data and it's presented with odds ratios, which the easiest way to understand that is if uh, your odds ratio is less than one, uh, you're basically better than average. And if it's greater than one, uh, you're not as well as average. This data is uh, very strange to look at. Um, and the reason why is that uh, if you just go back to our, uh, if you just conceptually at least go back to our readmission data, if if we had a one percent readmission rate, which which is pretty common for us, uh, when Nesquip looks at the data, they'll say, well, your expected data, if you had the average case mix and the average number of cases, would actually be much closer to the mean. And so they might say it's three and a half instead of one. So then they will figure an odds ratio based on this expected number, which is their model number. So it doesn't really reflect what happened. It really reflects more what they think is happening based on that nobody is really as good or as bad as they seem because they believe in this regression, uh, regression toward the mean. But you can still see here, uh, particularly in our all complications data that we are uniformly better than uh, Nesquip uh, average. And, um, and so we're really, we're, we're quite proud of this data. When, when we do th see things we don't like, we definitely uh, leap into action to try to figure out what the problem is and uh, what we can do about it. Great, I, I wanted to just touch upon this. Uh, this is sort of the discussion about quality whether it's clinical versus experiential. Um, and I think it, a lot of people want to measure the clinical side to make sure, like Don was mentioning, complications, readmissions, actual numbers, things that you can measure. But the experiential side is important too. This just came out yesterday, and I was very surprised and happy about that. It said top recommended hospitals in every state. Of course, that's Becker's, which everybody loves to feed off of that. So in Vermont, there's just two of them. It was uh, Copley and White River Junction, which is great. I'm very happy about that. Um, how do you get there? I think, I think we try to espouse a quality culture where people really do care for every patient, spend the time with every family, look at every circumstance, doing our best job to show compassion and competency. And so thankfully that has been here for a long time for decades in this hospital. And uh, I think we continue with that. And I know Sam would attest to that, that that's what we try to do and show that compassion. Yeah, I read it. 
Yeah. So uh, we're glad for this. Now, the funny thing is, the night before, Monday night, we got news of the latest, uh, you know, quality score for the hospital dropped a bit, and uh, you just throw up your hands. You're like, I don't know. Does it get better? Does it get worse? This is the this is what came out last night, night before. You know, we had some other information. So. The experiential people's opinion and thoughts about it will always move, but I think the staff done has always done a great job. Um, and when we talk about quality and access, um, there's many things we're, we're very good at. I think orthopedics is one of those. The spillover effect for us also being great in all surgery items because of our staff, their competency, whether it's general surgery or GYN surgery, et cetera, et cetera. So we're very thankful and happy for that. Uh, I want to go back to that comment of one of our best surgeons on staff who made a difference to the, the uh, you know, the, the gold new facility. Um, in that presentation, there's a lot of people there. It was great. We did a ribbon cutting. You know what he said, which was really remarkable, given sort of Copley's his history. He was very thankful for the Green Mountain Care Board and helping us through and being very diligent on the CON process. And literally everybody clapped. And there was like, so I just want to pass that on to you. You know what I mean? Uh, there is a lot of appreciation and, and it's hard because we're all working together to figure that out. Before we go into questions, I did want to say that I know everybody you look at when you do comparative data, there's so many reports uh, when you look at it. Um, you know, if people are above average with cost or issues, you know, the, the question is always, so what are you doing to help manage that? How are you managing your costs? How are you controlling your expenses, which we try to do? But we're we're well below when all those comparisons about how much the care we deliver. So if somebody said, so what are you doing, Joe, with your costs? My answer is, one, I'm keeping the costs as low as possible. Two, I'm trying to get relief to make us fair and reasonable because Jeff alluded to some of this. If, if we, I think last year he did a study on the data from maybe two years ago, but there was a study that, you know, our request could have been 50% to, to get to average. And if I ever asked for 50%, people would throw me out of the, they would throw me out of the state. Um, but if we got, if we got paid average, like 50%, um, we would have had an additional 92, $93 million in gross revenue, about 50 million net, and our operating margin would be 16 million. And so I know this is a hard discussion for everybody, like what do we do? How do we distribute funds? Who do we help out? How does that work? But just trying to make a case for us because it's really difficult. And I'm sure you don't want to hear about it because we've had increases, but again, going back to my analogy, there's still you know, four times Less expensive than others. So thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you all for that walkthrough. Um, we appreciate the presentation. Um, we'll turn to the board and um, Dr. Merman. Sure, thanks. Um, well, you uh, you addressed one of my questions. Is my audio okay now? Because it was totally messed up earlier. Okay. You. You address one of my questions on my list, which is uh, cash cow. So uh, I guess leave that there's one for no, later. There's no, there's oh. nothing left in the gutters. There is no cash cow. <laughs> it's a dry cow, David, and we're trying to. I'm sorry. All right. So all right. So in all seriousness, um, okay. So when I was looking through your submission, and I think we may have talked about this last year, but you might have to remind me on this. There was a pretty substantial decline in inpatient revenue from 2020 to the current budget. And look, it looks like most of that occurred in 2020 to 2022. So my questions in that are, um, how are your overall admission numbers? How, how much of this is due to moving ortho outpatient? Or do you have any other explanations for this decline in inpatient revenue? Yeah, that's probably the majority of it, but Jeff, I'll let Jeff. No, that is uh, definitely was the reason when Medicare actually in 2021 opened it up and actually communicated that uh, those orthopedic uh, procedures uh, um, needed to be considered as outpatient. The managed Medicare um, right now doesn't even, um, you know, approve them to be an inpatient. And so that's where the uh, the movement happened. And that and that 
so you're saying like Medicare Advantage plans don't approve them to be inpatient or the fee Medicare for, even fee for plans, we have to work with them through prior auth um, process because if they uh, um, if they're an inpatient, they're like, nope, that should be um, assumed as an outpatient first. And what about your inpatient volumes otherwise? Our inpatient volumes otherwise, um, they have been stabilizing. Um, they actually went up for uh, um, this year and we have a slight increase next year without that orthopedic volume. So, and are you uh, limited? Oh, Good. let me jump in, Dave. So it is interesting because so much of it went from, we had one day length of stay with orthopedics folks getting rehab, usually one day per well, it's like most of all in one day, maybe two days. But anyways, when that move happened, which was really dramatic, and it changed a lot of organizations to say, well, what, what happened? There's no, where's the rehab or what are you doing? Um, our inpatient business continued to stay strong. And to this day, it's still pretty strong. So I don't, I don't have an answer as to why it wouldn't have completely been extremely low, but we, we get admissions all the time. And I, sort of think of it as maybe COVID or post-COVID, but we, we're still really busy with missions on the inpatient side that I thought would have dropped permanently by like 50%. I don't know. It's the aging population too. So, I mean, one of the things that we see a lot, and I don't know that you can see me because of course I'm in the corner, but one of the things that we see a lot um, from the nursing perspective is a lot of the patients that are have a longer length of stay, it's because we can't get them into the long-term care facilities that they need to be in. And then also the fact of, you know, the patients that are coming in with more complex needs and we don't admit for mental health, but that doesn't mean that um, we don't get those upstairs and that it makes it really difficult to get them out. And we don't have a lot of places to send people. So um, I think we've seen since I've been here, there's been a huge influx of that. I do feel like we're going to see more. <clears throat> do you think that's affecting the, so there's inpatient days and number of admissions to, is the, are the uh, number of admissions declining while the inpatient days are uh, increasing? Having the inpatient days extend, it definitely limits how many admissions we can take. So I do think that that does sort of like affect each other. We do have occasional porters in the ED, but we can't necessarily admit those that have acute care needs because we have those that are upstairs that we can't get out. So I do think those do, yeah, tie together. Okay. Um, so regarding your commercial rate request for this year, um, how, if you were granted that rate, how would that rate be distributed through the the enterprise? Would it be even across inpatient, outpatient? Would you professional? What's the strategy for that? Well, you know, our first thing that we do um, with the rate increases, we do look at it as a um, an average increase. Um, we will go through all our supplies as well as our pharmaceuticals, which are also you know um, cost related. And we'll make sure that we're not charging um, less of. So we make sure that uh, you know those are all set. And then um, we look at it as a weighted average. Uh, um, we would give uh, the weighted average to our inpatient and to our outpatient. And typically we don't uh, um, give any of the increase to our professional because those are fees to schedule uh, based reimbursement. So when you say a weighted average, would you give the same weight to inpatient and outpatient, or would you give a different weight to inpatient versus outpatient? We would give different weights. We would take a look at, uh, you know, on um, the individual um, item and assess it and give it so that we overall come out with the um, weighted average, so different. So, so can, I, can I jump in, David? Sure. So I think historically there's always been the, um, the goal of your net patient revenue with the rate increase sort of dialing it in as opposed to saying uh, if you if you've got a three percent increase it's just three percent across the board for any and all services that discussion came up in the past year i think with some of the budget orders and so i think everybody is trying to figure that out dr merman we i'm, I'm aware of what's been done as i've worked in four hospitals in vermont um, so it's, it's a, it's a complicated subject of which you might get some differing opinion about that. So you're, you're touching upon a really, uh, complicated issue. 
yeah, I think, I, you know, I think last year we we tried to work towards standardizing this issue substantially, and it sounds like there's more work to be done. So with the with the rate that you were given last year, how did the weights end up for that inpatient versus outpatient? Um, off the top of my head, I, I, I we have the study, but I don't have that in front of me. But uh, um, you know, they weren't the same. It wasn't uh, applied equally to the inpatient items as well as to the outpatient items. And which think, do you think was preferenced in that in that distribution? Well, um, you know, I think that uh, when we take a look at our room and bed rates, um, those got less of an increase versus uh, we do look at uh, um, overall our lab, you know, and see where that is as in comparison to other um, organizations um, as well. And so the outpatient probably would have been a heavier uh, um, increase. Um, so when we look at the RAND data, um, so I, when I, I prefer to look at the RAND data in the standardized prices versus the percent of Medicare when looking at critical access hospitals, because critical access hospitals, Medicare is paid differently so that the proportion, you know, the percentage of a different payment is hard to compare to each other. And so when I look at this, the RAND prices, which I can what I looked at is uh, the standardized price, and, and I can send you this so that it's easier for your inpatient. You're in the kind of in the second decile nationally, um, but for your outpatient, you're in the sixth decile. And so, part of what I'm trying to get at is understanding. It, it, clearly, you're a very low cost inpatient hospital, and a lot of the items that you picked out, you're very low cost, but. But it appears from this that there's also, from a from a price standpoint, you're a little above average for the outpatient stuff. Now that's nationally, and and we see this trend a lot in Vermont hospitals that the inpatient commercial prices are quite low compared to the outpatient prices. And I was looking at your revenue and saw, oh wow, you know, it looked like 24 projected, you're 83 million dollars of outpatient revenue and 11 million dollars of inpatient revenue. So. Um, I'm trying to figure out how you think about sort of the future of your inpatient um, facility uh, if the, you have really low prices in the inpatient facility and are effectively struggling to pay the bills on the inpatient facility. So I guess with all that backdrop, how do you view your inpatient facilities moving forward? Sure. I've never really looked at it that way. I appreciate that perspective, Dr. Merman. You know, I, 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 I don't know, Jeff, if you have a comment. I, I, I would have to take a look at the data that, uh, you know, you actually um, were looking at. I'd love to see it. Yeah, I guess, so I guess a different thing to ask would be, do you have a similar chart? Uh, we, ha we had your bed day in there, but do you have a similar chart comparing Copley's outpatient? I mean, we know that orthopedics is a, Big strength for Copley and uh, and uh, great service for the state and the community. And it overall, we, we think it's probably low cost, but it's hard to tell because of how different things are priced differentially. So, do you have a chart for Copley's orthopedic procedures compared to other hospitals in Vermont, knowing that's such a big revenue generator for you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, actually, um, with that, we do have, um, you know, a chart. Um, I don't have it on me. Um, I can definitely supply it. It was in our CON. That was one of the CON questions. So, as we were going ahead to uh, um, to build that, one of the things they wanted to understand is our overall charges um, for an orthopedic procedure versus um, the rest of the state. Because, you know, as the Green Mountain Care Board, the CON process, they don't want to, you know, see us raise those rates. And those rates actually demonstrated that our orthopedics were well below um, the Vermont average. I don't think there was one organization that uh, was lower than us when we took a look at that. And to get that data, we did use the Medicare, uh, um, you know, price transparency data that's posted. Great. If if there is a chance you could send along an updated chart for that, I'd, I'd really appreciate seeing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, other questions I have. Um, what are some of your most pressing facility needs. Uh, I, I did take a walk through Copley at some point last year, and I might say saw the Joe Wooden bro Broken Pipe Tour. Um, 
but do, do you, what are what are some of the most pressing facility needs that you think you know from a strategic planning standpoint you'd like to address? Oh, that uh, great question. I appreciate that. Um, there's not the one thing that we're not doing. We're going through master facility planning. We're going to be presenting that um, at the retreat in November. So the the issue for us is uh, we're trying to avoid hail mary passes that yes we could solve everything if we could just build a three-story whatever a medical office building we've had architects in the past give us these wonderful ideas of spending lots of money and so we're just humbly trying to work through uh this old house the renovations are expensive small additions nothing huge we need to fix our parking our entrance to the hospital we need a better waiting room access for the emergency department. Radiology needs some space because that place hasn't been renovated in probably 60, maybe 70 years. So there's a lot of that stuff, David, that uh, will give us efficiency um, and cost savings, certainly with HVAC related items. We, we have problems with that. None of it is, I don't have a Hail Mary because I can't find, I can't find it within me to spend that much money and solve one thing. I've been in a lot of hospitals where they'll build this wonderful new huge addition and then the rest of the hospital looks like it's a, uh, you know, third world country and they just have two worlds there. So we're trying to figure it out. But so it's it's clinical services. So when people say, well, we'd love to send more orthopedics your way, we're trying to work on maybe uh, we're working on an additional OR uh, possibly a second procedure room. We're looking at clinic space like we have in Waterbury. So we try to consider those things because the demand for the clinical services, Orthopedics Plus, is really significantly there and continues to be a driver. So we're trying to meet that demand. I know uh, there are other specialties that people come to us for. I know Dr. Dupuy uh, does a lot of sophisticated hernia work. Um, well as some other things that we do that is a little bit noteworthy. So okay. surgery is one of those areas. And um, you know, and, that, and and people would say, which is interesting, we got an MRI find that we had the oldest MRI in the state, mobile in the back, attached to the hospital through rehab, which was really difficult. But anyways, we got a new MRI and somebody said the tour was like two years ago, we got it maybe a year and a half or two years. Somebody said, well, you know, the prices are going to go up to help pay for the new MRI. And it's interesting, the prices don't go up. We don't, we don't operate that way. So that's kind of something that people don't appreciate. Like, because we put in an MRI, it's not like, oh, we're going to raise the prices on the MRI because we put that in. We try to manage yeah. everything long term and not that people think that we're spending money on just one service. It's a good question. I don't have a great response that is uh, attractive or exciting. Sorry. Well, well, maybe we can, after your retreat, uh, maybe next year's budget hearing, we'll see more of your strategic plan for facilities. Yeah. Yes, you will. Um, one other thing I saw was there was a fairly large two-year increase from about 1.5 million to 2.5 million in MD benefits. So there's sort of a million dollar increase in the and one of those, oh, I should have the reference. I should have written that down. I'm sorry. But do, can you, do you have any explanation for the large increase in MD benefits? I do not know of anything that is unique or additional. The if you talk physician benefits, they fall within the same benefits with not everybody else. They don't have different health insurance. They don't have, uh, they're, they're kind of the same. The only thing I can imagine is uh, additional providers, but I don't. I, I I know of no discussion where we're gonna. Doctor Dupuy's eyes are lighting up. He's he's like, wow, there are better benefits coming for me. There aren't there aren't any. They're just we just have the same benefits, um, whether it's life insurance or disability or long term or dental or vision. So I don't know okay. what that. Would be. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. No, I, I, um, the other thing is, and if it was classified just into the MD, that would have been appropriate. But we are seeing our self-insurance program uh, um, a little bit higher than what we have seen in um, years past. And I'm hoping that uh, we classified that appropriately. We'll take a look at the data to make sure we did. So is that a plug for us to try to control health care cost growth? 
<laughs> I know, isn't it ironic? I know. All right, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna let the other board members go. I think I've taken up a lot of time. I'm sorry about that, but uh, thanks for taking my questions. Oh, thank you. All right, shall I jump in here, Chair Foster? I'm gonna take that as a yes. I'm getting a nod. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much to the Copley team. Um, and Mr. Wooden, I just want to acknowledge that I really always appreciate your directness, your humor, um, and especially your willingness to, uh, you know, embrace the hospital transformation efforts that we're doing at the state with Act 167. I've appreciated your willingness to engage in that process. So I wanted to say that uh, here. Um, all right, so I do have some questions. Uh, the first one is with this, uh, the New England, the, the Collaborative Health Network. I'm wondering what um, efficiencies, can you remind me if it's in there and I apologize, there has been some co cognitive overload, um, what the efficiencies that you've budgeted in fiscal year 25 are, if any, and I recognize it's new, so maybe there are no efficiencies already in the budget, but are there? If so. I don't, I don't think we're, we're looking at so definite uh, cost savings and efficiencies around um, collaborating with group purchasing supplies, actually contracts with a number of vendors and services. I want to be careful about it's a small town of Vermont, but we are looking at the estimate that we have on some of these is between 10 and 20 percent. Jeff prefers to for me to say 10 percent. But I know it's between 10 and 20 percent. So we are looking at making sure those contracts and that stuff. It, it takes time to actually switch over some of these things, but we're very hopeful and we have other participants. So we actually have people uh, who are other hospitals that are interested in joining and well, as well as my discussion about like the smaller community. So um, in, in the St. Albans Northwestern Medical Center community, they've got some local folks of size that are going to be joining that collaborative. So it's really kind it's, of exciting. It, it sounds fantastic. I'm just wondering if there's a dollar value, like, but for this network, collaborative network, what would have been the expense growth? Or is there actual, is it baked in yet? Or is it anticipated? It's not, it's not baked in yet because we have to do the contracts okay. and have every degree. And if we sort of go to standardized even aspects of uh, health insurance, certainly dental and vision will be easier. Uh, uh, Kathy DeMars, the board chair, she's over home health and hospice and she's looking at it. So, okay. so, so it's, yeah, it's probably more likely we'll see it in the fiscal year 26 yes. budget, but you're, but there's potential for some savings perhaps Absolutely. later in this year. Okay. Just trying Absolutely. to understand the timing of that. Great. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, with um, Dr. Merman's questions around the, the rate increase of 10.7, it would be really helpful for me to understand in a follow-up, um, what is the per actual percentage increase you're anticipating on inpatient versus the percentage in pre increase you're anticipating on outpatient? And I recognize zero for professional, but I would like to see that breakout separately. So if yep. that's possible to follow up with, I'd appreciate that. Yep. I think that, I, that's a good question, Jessica. I appreciate it. And I think historically we've always tied that to the concern over net patient revenue. So that's been always historically like, oh, you can do this, but you can't exceed the net patient revenue through these increases. You could exceed that because of unexpected volume, but it's not, it's, it's always been not proper to exceed that any other way. You know what I mean, but thanks Perfect. for that. We'll give you that. Yeah, it's just it's been helpful. We've been seeing it with the other hospitals. It's helpful to see where the the rate increases are going. So yeah, appreciate great. that. Um, so I, you know, I we saw um in the submission the clinical productivity, um, but I noticed there were no benchmarks associated with the work RVUs per clinical FTE. So I'm wondering why. Um, I assume that you do benchmark productivity so if you could talk a little bit about that that'd be helpful i mean overall right now um, we do demonstrate the data we do use mgma 
as our resource for um, for benchmarking to look at different practices. But uh, um, we don't publish those um, with our providers, um, you know, in the reports that we submit them. So for um, our providers, we do submit a monthly report which will demonstrate their worked RVUs, their visits, as well as their total charges. And we count like the visits just like uh, MGMA does so that they can take a look at that information. Okay, so that's great. So if you could, um, in a follow-up then, is just submit the, the benchmark percentiles from MGMA that are associated with the, um, the productivity piece. numbers, the specialties, yeah. yeah. Just to complete that table for us, that would be helpful. There was something yeah. that was missing from the submission. Um, and let me just see. I had some, a couple of other questions. Um, I wondered um, a bit about, so, you know, I, Mr. Wooden, I know you were there yesterday um, at our cognitive overload data analysis. Yeah. And uh, to be fair, I totally, it resonated with me too when you said cognitive overload. There was a lot of information presented yesterday. And, you know, I, pre I appreciate, I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to appreciate your insight because you have been a leader at several hospitals across the country um, and here in Vermont. And there was some discussion yesterday about um, efficient hospitals being able to manage to Medicare. And, um, you know, that was said multiple times yesterday and Copley, frankly, comes the closest to trying to manage to Medicare rates. As you pointed out, you know, according to Rand, you're at about 144 percent of Medicare. And so I'm curious your thoughts on that concept of what it would take to manage to Medicare in in Vermont, uh, particularly from a critical access hospital that does get close to close to cost reimbursement for Medicare. So just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I I mean, I, I sort of have the three buckets, the Medicaid, uh, the Medicare, and then the commercial, and then there's some other smaller buckets. But on the Medicaid side, that puts pressure on all of us to figure out how do you make that up. Um, on the Medicare side, that's more stable, but with Medicare Advantage, which we've seen an increase in that in Vermont, and that's been pushed, you know, with the, for the most part, insurance companies, many of them for profit. The Medicare Advantage really cuts into any of the CAH uh, benefit of just being, you know, close to covering costs. And so we still have the commercials sort of picking that up and needing to pick that up. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think there's a constant road of trying to coordinate more care trying to share services, share staff. We we now share a, a cardiologist with uh, Northwest Medical Center. We sent uh, our cardiologist part-time out there to keep costs down. So there's a lot of creative ways of doing it. I don't know how easy it is to manage just a Medicare in the real world, whether you're a CH or a non-CH. Some, some parts of the country, they say Medicare is gonna be your greatest payer. And uh, be thankful for that. We're not, not talking about CH hospitals. I, I don't, I don't know. I know that usually that you should always get more efficiency with size, right? If there's not a, an efficiency with size, and the amount of lab tests you're doing or the people that you're processing, then that's really curious. Sometimes we've seen studies where you don't see the efficiency with size. And in fact, with size or some networks, prices are more expensive, and it's, it's sort of Hard to believe that you would have that uh, negative effect of saying, "Wow, we're actually not getting efficiency of the size." So I don't, I don't know, Jessica. You're asking me a really good question. Um, it all sounds really difficult <laughs> and very hard to sort of manage to that, um, but we still are under the appropriate gun of figuring it out and being more efficient. Uh, in some degrees, though, we're sort of like the government. Sorry, that was an inappropriate comment. Uh, or thank you for like laughing. I said, I like your humor, so it's fine. It's sort of like, I mean, I think healthcare is like the federal government and state government when you're sort of buying hammers for $190, when in fact you can get one at Home Depot for eight. And it's like higher education, which is university and colleges, which so healthcare 
it is difficult. We don't think out of the box. We're not super creative. Uh, I think this change going into outpatient orthopedics has been pretty dramatic. I saw that when I was in Alaska from the California West Coast. They were doing that, and the insurance companies were pushing for it. We thought it was very detestable many years ago when they were doing it, but it's actually better for the patient, better recovery. It's sort of like not sitting in a bed for five days after giving birth or two weeks. It's like you want to get up and move, and it's better for the patient. It's better cost. So you can do both. I think there's a lot of opportunity to save money and provide better quality. Sometimes we go kicking and screaming, though. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's that's the goal. That's the goal, and hopefully Act 167 gets us closer there, that work. Yeah. Um, let me just ask another question uh, about the the new medical office building. Um, and I appreciate your comment about the gold mine or not the gold mine. Um, but... I do would like to understand, um, you know, the, there was comment there in that same article about doubling patient capacity, going from two providers a day to five to six providers a day. And I'm wondering if you can break out for us, and I recognize this will be a follow-up question, what is the anticipated increase in net patient revenue and impact on margin for fiscal year 25 from the expansion there? And I, I recognize that's probably going to be a uh, follow-up question, unless I'll, Jeff has I'll, it off the top of his head. <laughs> well, I'll ask Jeff, but, but I think like with any of these things, like we do master facility planning dynamically, and you know, we thought about, we've, we've moved some departments, we've done this, and in the process, we realized, oh, that was more expensive than we thought, that took too much time, oh, we have another option. I think there's some decompression that Jeff might talk about and we don't know, you do the best job you can to estimate what's going to happen with the volumes and patients and people showing up. We, you know, we, don't, we don't know what's going to happen when UVM opens up six more ORs. But what was in the budget, Jeff? What's yeah, so when we submitted the CON, um, it was all about decompressing, um, using our current providers. The comment that uh, they're seeing more patients, uh, if you had an understanding of where the Waterbury Clinic was prior to us moving. It was literally in the house on Main Street in Waterbury. You had to enter it from the uh, back entrance. It was very cramped and uh, um, tight quarters. Um, we basically um, now are able to decompress our main office campus up here, Mansfield Orthopedics, and send more providers um, down there, which is the communication of the procedures, um, the visits actually um, increasing. But overall, for our system, we are not seeing like the overall visits increase because we're still using the same, um, you know, uh, providers. We did, however, um, budget um, an increase. Uh, we did go from one um, X-ray um, to two X-rays. And so that was um, an increase in revenue. And I, it, I think it came in um, about 500,000 is what uh, we communicated through the uh, um, CON. Okay, so there's, no, there's not gonna be a doubling of patient capacity and associated utilization. No, not for Copley as a whole, but for that, um, that site specific, if it's going to be a decompression from this main okay. campus. Got it, okay. I wanna, Give opportunity for other people to ask questions. Thank you so much. Any other board member questions? I have a couple. I can go ahead and jump in. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're having a good afternoon. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your travelers. Um, I know in your narrative, which is on page 10, in case uh, you'd like to pull it up. You were noting that you're budgeted at 21, which is down from 27. Um, and in on page 16, you mentioned your LNA program. I'm just curious why um, you haven't pursued a grow your own for nursing or whether that's just not mentioned. Um. Great, I'm so glad Sam is here because that's part of her job. Yeah, so I actually started here in nursing education, so this is kind of my jam. <laughs> so um, I would say we do have a Grow Your Own program. We are shifting um, a little bit. We have a nurse residency program here that we started. I feel like this is year two now. Um, it's, it, 
Um, we probably have had, we've had over a dozen new nurses come here um, since then. And um, I've been a part of that whole residency program. Our retention has been, um, I, I think maybe one has gone to another facility in another state. That would be the only thing. So we've had great retention. Um, our LNA program, we do that as well. So I help with that. And then as far as um, we actually have, we're a clinical site for the Vermont State University as well. So we did have a dual appointment position with Vermont State University. Um, so we, we, I'm not sure who's familiar with that process, but what that just meant was that we employed them. They gave us a percentage for that employee. Um, there was, you know, some discussions because we were one of two hospitals that did that at the time and figured out that, you know, that probably wasn't the best with our financial status of doing that when um, the only thing they were doing was clinicals. So since that change, what I've done is I'm working with the Vermont State University to get still us to be a clinical site, but that they are actually sending a clinical associate see it here. So kind of like other facilities um, within Vermont, um, it's they, and I've been a clinical instructor in the past, they would just go to the facility with the students and still have that experience. So um, we've had students come from that program and it actually is great because they've been here for two years at that point. So um, it, we do kind of do a grow, grow our own. And then we work really closely with the um, Green Mountain Tech uh, Career Center as well. And we go there to say our what we have available here for jobs, but also we take those students for clinicals here. So then we have some that come here from the Green Mountain Tech Co-op program and they do their clinicals. But what that is, is they're working. So, and they're employees. So. We work really closely with that uh, school as well. So um, it's kind of our pipeline. So we have different tentacles out there in different professions. And uh, we have a scholarship program here. Um, so that has helped us to uh, radiology tech. We, we have been able to help and she's, she's one of our own. Um, I can't speak to the HR, but I think it was healthcare path career pathways that um, our recruiters worked with CVM or CCV um, with to get staff through. So we have a lot of different pipelines here. Great. That it's good to hear a little bit more about it because it it seems like some hospitals have been very very successful in terms of reducing their travelers and. Of course, that is if you're able to do that. There's many good benefits to that. So. Um, uh, it's good to hear a little bit more about those efforts. Do you think those efforts will be successful in reducing your travelers from 27 to 21 and potentially more in the future? I do, and I think that we actually have had sort of like this up and down effect. So with the new, the residency program, we went on med surge from like 12 travelers to three. I mean, so you can see there's a shift, and then I think, you know, as far as travelers, it's not just nursing, right? So sure. we're looking at the fact that other departments might be having an influx with travelers too. So I think there's certain departments that it has worked really well for, so we can take those experiences and we can use them for other departments now. So I do see that that will help with the traveler uh, piece. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I. I'm having trouble locating the exact page, but I believe that I read in your narrative um, that there was uh, a 34% turnover rate that was mentioned somewhere in there. I wonder if anyone can speak to that. What is the year range? That was the HR. Um, I'll make this time. Yeah, I get it. Um, and if you need a moment, I'm happy to. I think it actually might have been on page one. Yeah, it's in the one. Two, it's on page one of your narrative executive summary. Uh, fourth paragraph down, unprecedented workforce challenges. Over the past two years, our overall staff vacancy rate has reached as high as 34%. 
Yeah, that I think um, we'll look into that, Robin. But I think that's vacancy rate as opposed to turnover rate. Uh, turn uh -huh. How many positions are not filled as opposed to staff taking jobs and quitting and turning over? So I think that's a vacancy rate, but I can check on that. Okay. Yep. No, it does say I might have misspoke. It does say staff vacancy rate. Um, yeah. Can you speak to some of the? Can you give some color commentary on that? vacancy rate and what are some of the challenges to attracting staff? Oh, uh, well, I, I guess I'm going to wax and wane philosophical about what happened during the COVID years. Uh -huh. So those three to four years, I think, changed a lot in the country expectations. YOLO, you only live once. I mean, we, it was it was an exhausting three year period of time. I think at the height of it, some of the nurses were making more money than a primary care doctor who went through all the education and residency. We were at the height of it. Some people were paying uh, in excess of $200 an hour. So I do sure. know that uh, that was uh, exhausting and difficult. I was asked the other day about this in a meeting, and they said, so what's your thoughts about this and how are things going because of how wild things were? I will tell you this, there was no such thing as a traveler in the lab, didn't even exist. A traveler in radiology, maybe it was mainly nursing. Because it was COVID, the entire industry absorbed laboratory techs that went to pharmaceutical companies as well as to the government to do COVID testing. And I lived it. It was insane to go from uh, little to no problems. Nobody even knew what a traveler in the lab was, and we needed traveler techs in the lab. So um, my only encouragement of late is that when I look at my email and the amount of spam that I currently get from um, travel agents, traveling labor companies, both for doctors but nurses and all sorts of techs, of the past six to nine months, I am giddy with the fact that my spam is almost back to normal and I have people advertising. They literally give you names. Hey, we have Bob and Sally, here's their credentials. We didn't see anything for a couple of years and it was super scary. So I think the world is settling down. I think people are realizing that there's not as many opportunities. I think folks are finally like, okay, I gotta get a job. I can't keep moving around. So I think hopefully Robin, it's getting better. Uh, okay. For us, housing is a problem, which is true for others. We've been trying to address housing to make it easy for somebody to come from North Carolina. We had travelers that actually couldn't even stay because they couldn't get housing. They ended up in a Stowe motel, and we had some cases where people they had to leave and said, I can't even get any housing. And the other thing is child care. So the two things that we know as a benefit competitively for, for us in our community is, is certainly housing, transitional housing, people from either other communities, countries, other states, as well as childcare, because uh, a lot of these are younger people and um, you don't have childcare. Uh, can you imagine how difficult it is to figure out the quality of childcare in Vermont, you know, on the edge of the Northeast Kingdom, it's really a problem. So we've talked about it a lot in the board. We don't, we don't have the money, you know, we wish we could solve it, but. Yeah. We, don't have, we don't have any money to even address it very well. So. Great, but I, thank you. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I could speak to the nursing union piece, which when we just resolved our negotiations, you know, in three days here and we settled and we have a great relationship with them, but then hearing UVM have that huge nursing increase <laughs> makes it a little bit difficult for us too when, um, you know, that's something that we have great quality, but you're paying a percentage more, so. Yeah. We've certainly heard that uh, in prior years about how uh, the, the wages are quite competitive among hospitals. Um, so the last question is something that I'm interested in hearing from all hospitals about a little bit. Um, it's interesting to get your numbers around the borders. Do, but what I'm curious about is if you have uh, data where you can parse the the reasons for the boarding 
um, and or the types of patients that are boarding, as well as uh, whether there's a payer mix difference among the boarders versus your general hospital. And we certainly heard from the, the first hospital today that that information is, uh, people have sort of a sense or they didn't have easy to collect data, but I was curious what the situation was for you. So first, um, if I may, and then I'm gonna hand it off. Um, is our EMR right now doesn't collect that information, so it would be more of a hypothetical. Um, and with that, I'll go to you know Sam to uh, finish the answer. Yeah, so we have two different kinds of borders. And actually, when Jeff was asking me questions about this, we did, we were talking about two different ways. So we have our mental health, you know, holds, which are considered borders here, and then yep. we have that we can't get upstairs because uh, typ typically it's real estate issues, which we just don't have the space. And so for the um, those that we're holding down in the ED and we're looking for placement for mental health reasons, um, again, I think both of these situations, we're looking for placement. It's difficult to, to do that in a small, I mean, in any facility, but in a small hospital. For those that are in the ED for uh, mental health hold, um, it really does take our nurse manager to call TMH to try to get you know, something to happen faster. And so that takes one individual who, you know, should work seven days a week, 24 hours a day to call the office. And so that would be one yeah. of the issues. And then you you do have the fact that, you know, with the, the first and second certs and all of that, the time that it takes. So the other piece of that is the medical borders. And, you know, we are very frequently, oh, you know, at capacity on med surge. Um, and typically it's not caused by a staffing issue because I feel like we are pretty good right now. Um, we take even med surge patients on our birthing center. I mean, we, we try to be creative as to like which department they can go into, you know, a nurse is not a nurse, it's not a nurse, but they do have those basic skills for med surge. Um, training had to happen, competencies had to happen, but um, we do try to get them up as much as we can. I don't have a number, but I will say it's it's a couple, maybe every other week we have a couple in the ED and we try as best as we can to get them out, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's all I have. Thanks very much. Any other board member questions? Great, I'll turn to that. All right, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Um, it, Member Walsh, were you trying to jump in? I just wanted to say thanks for the presentation and uh, appreciate all the hard work that went into it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee, and thank you, Copley. Um, uh, we are going to do the same thing we did in the last, uh, for the board members' sake, we the same thing we did in the last with SVMC, and as I'm going to ask a question or two uh, around um, Act 119 compliance and um, uh, bad debt and free care, and then Sam Peisch will follow up with more broad questions. Um, so about Act 119 compliance, I think um, we've been in touch with you. Um, I think the right thing for me to say here is um, um, we're going to need to do some follow up with you. I don't think it makes sense to go through all of the areas where we're concerned about a lack of compliance with the law. Um, but I want to give you an opportunity to sort of more broadly respond about um, um, sort of plan, plan for correcting the your policy. I should say maybe more accurately your um, your your application. The application. Um, so the application, you know, we look to you. You've uh, um, offered us, you know, help and been calling. You know, um, let us know what we need to do, and uh, um, we'll work on you know getting that uh, updated. I believe the application unfortunately um was still the old application um so we did have the uh, uh plain language out there 
Um, we now have the uh, actual policy out there, but I don't believe the application was updated, so we're working on that. So we look for you um, to help us. Um, we'll be totally open, understanding what we need to do to uh, to get in line. Yeah, I, uh, thanks. You know, we we have been happy to engage with all hospitals on this, and are happy to continue to engage with you. Um, uh, and um, <clears throat> All right, I think I think enough said on that. <laughs> um, um, I also do want to just call your attention to you know the last full year of data on your ratio of bad debt to free care. Um, your um, your your you know for every dollar of free care you're giving you gave out in twenty three, um, you had four dollars, a little over four and a half dollars of of um, bad debt or medical debt, um, and um, um, when I look at your projections for the uh, for the coming year, uh, um, maybe we're, I'm going to start to see a pattern here. But you you're projecting a pretty significant increase in uncompensated care in both bad debt and free care um, for 25. I, can you say anything about um, what you see going on uh, um, going forward for uncompensated care? Um, hopefully, uh, you know, when we take a look at our um, our bad debt and our free care, um, we do look at our gross charges to budget for that. So that increase is a reflection of uh, um, our gross charges due to the rate increases going in there. Um, that's contributing to that increase. But the ratio is we always um, try to, you know, we look at our history and we see that uh, the bad debt um, has been about, uh, um, you know, 3.2% of our gross charges, and that's what we would budget. And our current uh, affordable care is about 0.9% um, of our gross charges, and that's what we budgeted for. But the increase that you're seeing from year to year is due to the increase in gross revenue. Okay. Um, okay, well, we, we will send a follow up with you about uh, Act 119 compliance. Um, um, again, I don't think it makes sense to go through the details of it here. I don't think it'd be productive for anybody. Um, and, um, but just to recognize that, you know, the law went into effect July 1st. Um, so um, I don't know what happens if a, um, if a case, uh, if a person uh, feels aggrieved that they've been turned down for free care at this moment, um, given the given the policy, so I just want to say that out loud. Thank you, uh, thank you, appreciate it, and look forward to working with you on this. Um, Sam, do you have more? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your help. Thanks for your help on that, Mike. I appreciate it. We, you know, sometimes we just miss things, so appreciate you getting us in compliance there. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, uh, good to see you, Joe, and, and the team. Thanks for your presentation this morning, or rather this afternoon. Um, just a couple questions. One of them, I, I know you've spent some time talking about the challenges with, with your commercial rate requests and, and prices over time. And I'm wondering, and I want to recognize, Joe, how you approach the Act 167 process. I think it's worth highlighting your openness to it, to thinking differently and, and challenging some of the assumptions that um, sometimes we all have about outside consultants and whatnot. And I'm wondering if there was anything through that process, which I know is still unfolding, that hold promise in terms of cutting costs or increasing revenue that you've seen through that process or that are reflected in your submission. Um, nothing in our submission. Uh, I mean, um, I think I think Dr. Hamry did a great job on some scenarios about if you did a better job with uh, orders or getting people out into the community. I, I think it was really nice to be encouraged to say we want the small hospitals to, to take care of people in the community and not to ship unnecessarily to either Dartmouth or UVM, which have their own host of problems and they have capacity issues. So he's very encouraging about saying, so you, you want to look at the services maybe that you you want to cut back on, or dare I say, maybe you shouldn't be doing those. 
uh, to have capacity to do some of the stuff that you should be doing. So it was a twofold message, uh, but both are a little bit scary. It's hard to just crank up and all of a sudden provide services that you don't provide. But um, I will say that I'm, I'm gonna ask everybody to help us through the process because you talk about services or doing something a little bit different um, that really can upset people, but we can only afford what we can afford. And I think we're probably, you know, one of the more dire hospitals that really needs to participate on all fronts to figure out how we're going to become more financially healthy, whether it's because of master facility planning, unmet needs, or staffing uh, wages, or childcare, or a bunch of other things. So I'm going to be getting back to people. I will be calling in favors and saying, okay, can I present to you and can you offer some advice or help or maybe some assistance as we go down the road with some of those and talk to other hospitals. I do like the model of some specialized uh, areas of excellence. I know years ago I was in a hospital, small hospital, and they did a lot of cataracts. They had two, for some reason, they had two amazing cataract surgeons and they put out more cataracts than you would believe that people would travel there for cataract surgery. It's not that that's easily determined, but if there's stuff that we can do better or things that we might want to pass on to another hospital, we're going to have to sort of talk about that. It's very uncomfortable, though. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know. No, thank you for that. Um, my other question relates to, I know Member Holmes asked a question about the New England Collaborative Health Network, which is also interesting to us. Um, and I spent some time reading a bit about it. And on, on the website for the network, it talks about how Ovation Healthcare is the engine within the network, you know, bring yeah. shared services. And I, I'm assuming you're aware that Ovation is owned by a private equity firm, Grand Avenue Capital. I'm just wondering if you have, I mean, it's a broad kind of system level. Can some people have concerns about private equity in the healthcare system? And I'm wondering how you approach that relationship and that contractual relationship with them. Well, I private equity sort of speaks to the difference between nonprofit versus private. Now, thankfully, we have all nonprofit hospitals. We don't have any private hospitals. But also, that speaks to the analogy of whether you're hiring a consulting firm or a large audit firm that are all private or owned, perhaps stock market investors. You know, we we deal with a lot of people in the private market who do give us advice. And so I, Ovation is very helpful. They're very helpful because their focus is rural independent hospitals and healthcare systems in America. That is their focus. They are not trying to address uh, research. They're not trying to look at pharmaceuticals. They're not into academic medical centers. Their main focus is rural independent hospitals and trying to fill that gap all across the country, which is a pretty significant gap. You know, maybe it's the cracks between the, uh, the stones or the bricks, but there's a lot throughout, not just Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, others where folks haven't joined a network. They want to be independent and they need that sort of help. So they're trying to stay focused with that. If we did not have them. I guarantee that we would not be able to work together because we need somebody to be that uh, separate driving accountable force to help us uh, reach agreement, work together, sign up for those contracts that uh, Jessica was referencing to save money. You know, otherwise we might fall into small discussions about, as opposed to saying, look, we got to standardize, we got to be a team, we got to stay focused. So we're glad we had them. If it wasn't them, it would be somebody else. Who, I don't know of anybody else who would provide those services for us. So. We're not 100% forever obligated to them. So we think this is a really good start and we're happy to grow the services and see how that works. I don't know if that answers it. I, they've, never been, they've never been sort of driven off of feeling like there's a uh, productivity return on their time. And I know the board members have met with them many times and people know. I don't know, Kathy, if you have any comments about that. I mean, Ovation, We've, we've dealt with them on, on several different issues. I think they've been sort of the engine that kept going for us. We don't have the internal manpower, I don't think anybody, to make sure the contracts are signed, to gather the information, 
um, and we've needed them to get to this point. So obviously to me, the work they've been doing has worked to get us here. And it's not just the hospitals, it's myself as a home health agency. We're also looking, we're, we're part of this collaborative also, and we're looking at health insurance rates and things. So they're helping all of us to potentially save money in healthcare. So I've been very impressed with them. Okay, no, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm I'm also wondering how you evaluate the cost benefit of purchasing those services relative um, to everything else over time. And maybe you spoke to that and I missed it. Yeah, the, well, there's, it's easy on, on many things. It's pretty easy. What did you pay for your dental program for this many employees? What did you pay for uh, pharmaceuticals, implants? band-aids, whatever, whatever it is, what are you looking at for medical malpractice? What are you paying for, for directors and offices insurance? What are you paying for oil? How much you, so, so all of those things, many of those, Sam, have an excellent, really easy, identifiable, like that's mm -hmm. great. Now, when you talk about, hey, could you help us with strategic planning? Well, that's a little bit harder. We could actually pay somebody as a private consultant, um, you know, like Bruce Hamery to help us with strategic planning. We, get two estimates or something like that, or helping us with master facility planning, as I said, strategic planning. So some of those with regards to education, the board members, aspects of medical staff's leadership, those are a little harder to measure. I mean, you could sort of compare though, but much of this is easy to measure. It's gonna be really easy to say, yeah, we actually saved, you know, $52,000 a year on that, on that service. Okay, thank you. Um... So it sounds like you're not concerned about being seen as an acquisition target. Is that fair to say? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Um, a, Vermont, a Vermont hospital ever being considered an acquisition target would be really surprising to me. That would be, <laughs> I can't imagine anybody would want to enter into the Vermont field of hospital healthcare delivery. Just saying. Okay. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for your time. Um, we're going to take public comment at the end of all the presentations today. And so I think that's all we have. Thank you guys for coming in and for the presentation um, and have a nice afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, we'll, thank you. We'll take a break until um, we're going to take a little bit longer. We're scheduled for 245 for Rutland. We'll go till 250 and we'll start Rutland at 250. Thank you. <laughs>